right, so chicken is down here because I have to... Well, hello, I'm back, sort of. I was... Well, yes. I was between... Why isn't this going? Oh, no, it's on mute. So we're going to check to, well, okay. Oh. I was between whether or not, I was going back and forth by whether I should come back and do this because I still have a little tickle left. Do I eat sandwich? What kind of a sandwich? I like sandwiches. Sandwiches are tasty. I just had a sandwich recently. It was a very large sandwich. It had alfalfa sprouts on it and turkey. Yeah. Do you like sandwiches? I mean, who doesn't like sandwiches? They're so versatile. But yes, anyway. <laughs> I'm a little red. I got some sun, so I look like a tomato. Which it goes with the sandwich theme. Um, but yes, so I apologize if I still have a little bit of a um, coffee sort of a thing. Um, so hopefully it won't do anything to the content. We're reading Poe. Um, we're starting with King Pess, a tale containing an allegory. And it sounds like chicken is okay down here, so we are going to be okay with that. All right, let us see what King Pess is. Do you like Poe? I like Poe. I found I like Poe very, very much. I always knew... I mean, I have. I've been a literature person for a long time, so he's always been there, but I did. I'm glad that I decided to go through all of these because it he's way beyond even what I expected. And like the title says. No, no, Poe. <laughs> Poe. P-O-E. Edgar Allan Poe. I apologize. Edgar Allan Poe. Um, he is... He does. He blends the grotesque with the romance, with the satire and the humor, and I love it. I love it very much. Um, so yeah, so that's what we're getting today. We're getting humor, and we're getting romance and grotesqueness, which always go together, right? So King Pest. Um, you know what? We might just go through it, because I think... Yeah, I think there's like a plague and I want to, oh, I think this one actually described, was described as the hangover <laughs> during the Black Plague, which kind of is fitting for um, nowadays in a um, potentially tasteless way. But that's okay. I like tasteless. So we're going to go ahead and do some Black Plague hangover <laughs> from Edgar Allan Poe. So this is King Pest, a tale containing an allegory. The gods do bear and well allow in kings the things which they abhor in rascal routs. Buckhurst's tragedy of Ferrix and Porrix. That sounds a little bit like a do as I say, not as I do sort of a thing when it comes to um, the those in power? Question mark. So we shall see. We shall see at the end of this here potential allegory. About twelve o'clock, one night in the month of October, and during the chivalrous reign of the third Edward, two seamen, seamen, belonging to the crew of the free and easy. <laughs> make that joke in your mind, I'm not going to make it, because I'm a lady. A trading schooner plying between Sluis and the Thames, and then at anchor in that river, were much astonished to find themselves seated in the taproom of an alehouse in the parish of St. Andrews, London, which alehouse bore for sign the portraiture of a jolly tar. The room, although ill-contrived, smoke-blackened, low-pitched, and in every other respect agreeing with the general character of such places at the period, was, nevertheless, in the opinion of the grotesque groups scattered here and there within it, sufficiently well adapted to its purpose. Of these groups, our two seamen formed, I think, the most interesting, if not the most conspicuous. The one who appeared to be the elder, and whom his companion addressed by the characteristic appellation of legs, was at the same time much the taller of the two. He might have measured six feet and a half, and an habitual stoop in the shoulders seemed to have been the, the necessary consequence of an altitude so enormous. Superfluities in height were, however, more than accounted for by deficiencies in other respects. He was exceedingly thin, and might, as his associates asserted, have answered, when drunk, 
for a penance at the masthead, or, when sober, have served for a jib boom. But these jests and others of a similar nature had evidently produced at no time any effect upon the cachinatory... Ah, shoot. Oh, no, cachinatory. I love the word. I don't know what it means. Any effect upon the cachinatory muscles of the tar. So something to do with a ship. Uh, with high cheekbones, a large hawk nose, retreating chin, fallen under jaw, and huge protruding white eyes, the expression of his countenance, although tinged with a species of dogged indifference to matters and things in general, was not the less utterly solemn and serious beyond all attempts at imitation or description. The younger seaman was, in all outward appearance, the, con the converse of his companion. His stature could not have exceeded four feet. A pair of stumpy bow legs supported his squat, unwieldy unwieldy? I've seen it unwieldy. Ah, it's a bank! Wop. Unwieldy, unwieldy. Uh, figure, while his unusually short and thick arms, with no ordinary fists at their extremities, swung off dangling from his sides like the fins of a sea turtle. Small eyes of no particular color twinkled far back in his head. His nose remained buried in the mass of flesh which enveloped his round, full, and purple face, and his thick upper lip rested upon the still thicker one beneath with an air of complacent self-satisfaction, much heightened by the owner's habit of licking them at intervals. He evidently regarded his tall shipmate with a feeling of, with a feeling half wondrous, half quizzical, and stared up occasionally in his face as the red setting sun stares up at the crags of Ben Nevis. Various and eventful, however, had been the peregrinations. A journey, especially a long or meandering one. Peregrinations. Various and eventful, however, had been the peregrinations of the worthy couple in and about the different tap houses of the neighborhood during the earlier hours of the night. Funds, even the most ample, are not always everlasting, and it was with empty pockets our friends had ventured upon the present hostelry. At the precise period, then, when this history properly commences, Legs and his fellow Hugh Tarpaulin sat, each with both elbows resting upon the large oaken table, in the middle of the floor and with a hand upon either cheek. They were eyeing, from behind a huge flagon of unpaid-for humming stuff, that'll be fun to start using, the portentous words, no chalk, which to their indignation and astonishment were scored over the doorway by means of that very mineral whose presence they purported to deny. Not that the gift of deciphering written characters, a gift among the commonality of that day, considered little, considered little less cabal, cabalistical than the art of indicting, come here, could, in strict justice, have been laid to the charge of either disciple of the sea, but there was, to say the truth, a certain twist in the formation of the letters, an indescribable lee lurch about the whole, which foreboded, in the opinion of both seamen, a long run of dirty weather, and determined them at once, in the allegorical words of Legs himself, to pump ship, clue up all sail, and scud before the wind. Having accordingly disposed of what remained of the ale, and looped up the points of their short doublets, they finally made a bolt for the street. Although Tarpaulin rolled twice into the fireplace, mistaking it for the door, yet their escape was at length happily effected, and half after twelve o'clock found our heroes ripe for mischief, and running for life down a dark alley in the direction of St. Andrew's Stair, hotly pursued by the landlady of the Jolly Tar. So they just drank and dashed at the epoch of this eventful tale and periodically for many years before and after all england but more especially the metro the metropolis resounded with the fearful cry of plague which is something we should all start using as well this city was in a great measure depopulated and in those horrible regions in the vicinity of the thames where amid the dark narrow and filthy lanes and alleys the demon of disease was supposed to have had his his nativity. Ah, terror and superstition were alone to be found stalking abroad. By authority of the king, such districts were placed under ban, mm -hmm, and all persons forbidden under pain of death to intrude upon their dismal solitude. 
Yet neither the mandate of the monarch, nor the huge barriers erected at the entrances of the streets, nor the prospect of that loathsome death which, with almost absolute certainty, overwhelmed the wretch whom no peril could deter from the adventure, prevented the unfurnished and untenanted dwellings from being stripped, by the hand of knightly rapine, of every article, such as iron, brass, or leadwork, which could in any manner be turned to a profitable account. Above all, it was usually found, upon the annual winter opening of the barriers, that locks, bolts, and secret cellars had proved but slender protection to, the, to those rich stores of wines and liquors which, in consideration of the risk and trouble of removal, many of the numerous dealers having shops in the neighborhood had consented to trust during the period of exile to so insufficient a security. But there were very few of the terror-stricken people who attributed these doings to the agency of human hands. Pest spirits, plague goblins, and fever demons were the popular imps of mischief, and tales so blood-chilling were hourly told that the whole mass of forbidden buildings was, at length, enveloped in terror as in a shroud, and the plunderer himself was often scared away by the horrors his own depredations had created, leaving the entire vast circuit of prohibited district to gloom, silence, pestilence, and death. It was by one of the terrific barriers already mentioned, and which indicated the region beyond to be under the pest ban, that, in scrambling down an alley, Legs and the worthy Hugh Tarpaulin found their progress suddenly impeded. To return was out of the question, and no time was to be lost as their pursuers were close upon their heels. With thoroughbred seamen to clamber up the roughly fashioned plank work was a trifle, and maddened with the twofold excitement of exercise and liquor, they leaped unhesitatingly down within the enclosure, and holding on their drunken course with shouts and yellings, were soon bewildered in its noisome and intricate recesses. Had they not indeed been intoxicated beyond moral sense, their reeling footsteps must have been palsied by the horrors of their situation. The air was cold and misty, the paving stones loosened from their beds lay in wild disorder amid the tall, rank grass which sprang up around the feet and ankles. Fallen houses choked up the streets, the most fetid and poisonous smells everywhere prevailed, and by the aid of that ghastly light which, even at midnight, never fails to emanate from a vapory and pestilential atmosphere, might be discerned lying in the bypaths and alleys, or rotting in the windowless habitations, the carcass of many a nocturnal plunderer arrested by the hand of the plague in the very perpetration of his robbery. But it lay not in the power of images or sensations or impediments such as these to stay the course of men who, naturally brave, and at that time especially brimful of courage and of humming stuff, would have reeled, as straight as their condition might have permitted, undauntedly into the very jaws of death. <laughs> onward, still onward, stalked the grim legs, making the desolate solemnity echo and re-echo with yells like the terrific war-whoop of the Indian, and onward, still onward, rolled the dumpy tarpaulin, hanging on to the doublet of his more active companion, and far surpassing the latter's most strenuous exertions in the way of vocal music, by bull roarings in basso from the profundity of his stentorian lungs. They had now evidently reached the stronghold of the pestilence. Their way at every step or plunge grew more noisome and more horrible, the paths more narrow and more intricate, huge stones and beams falling momently from the decaying roofs above them gave evidence by their sullen and heavy descent of the vast height of the surrounding houses. And while actual exertion became necessary, to force a passage through frequent heaps of rubbish, it was by no means seldom that the hand fell upon a skeleton or rested upon a more fleshy corpse. Blech. Suddenly, as the seamen stumbled against the entrance of a tall and ghastly-looking building, a yell more than usually shrill from the throat of the excited legs was replied to from within in a rapid succession of wild, laughter-like, and fiendish shrieks. Nothing daunted at, so at sounds which, of such a nature, at such a time, and in such a place, might have curdled the very blood in hearts less irrevocably on fire, the drunken couple rushed headlong against the door, burst it open, and staggered into the midst of things with a volley of curses. The room within which they found themselves proved to be the shop of an undertaker. But an open trap door, 
in a corner of the floor near the entrance, looked down upon a long range of wine cellars, whose depths the occasional sound of bursting bottles proclaimed to be well stored with their appropriate contents. In the middle of the room stood a table, in the center of which again arose a huge tub of what appeared to be punch. Bottles of various wines and cordials, together with jugs, pitchers, and flagons of every shape and quality, were scattered profusely upon the board. Around it, upon coffin trestles, was seated a company of six. This company I will endeavor to delineate one by one. Fronting the entrance, and elevated a little above his companions, sat a personage who appeared to be the president of the table. His stature was gaunt and tall, and legs was confounded to behold in him a figure more emaciated than himself. His face was as yellow as saffron, but no feature, excepting one alone, was sufficiently marked to merit a particular description. This one consisted in a forehead so unusually and hideously lofty as to have the appearance of a bonnet or crown of flesh superadded upon the natural head. His mouth was puckered and dimpled into an expression of ghastly affability, and his eyes, as indeed the eyes of all at table, were glazed over with the fumes of intoxication. This gentleman was clothed from head to foot in a richly embroidered black silk velvet pall, wrapped negligently around his form after the fashion of a Spanish cloak. His head was stuck full of sable, her of sable hearse plumes, which he nodded to and fro with a jaunty and knowing air, and in his right hand he held a huge human thigh bone, with which he appeared to have been just knocking down some member of the company for a song. Opposite him, and with her back to the door, was a lady of no whit the less extraordinary character. Although quite as tall as the person just described, she had no right to complain of his unnatural emaciation. She was evidently in the last stage of a dropsy. Old-fashioned or less technical form for edema. And her figure resembled nearly that of the huge puncheon of October beer, which stood, with the head driven in, close by her side, in a corner of the chamber. Her face was exceedingly round, red, and full, and the same peculiarity, or rather want of peculiarity, attached itself to her countenance, which I before mentioned in the case of the president. That is to say, only one feature of her face was sufficiently distinguished to need a separate characterization. Indeed, the acute tarpaulin immediately observed that the same remark might have applied to each individual person of the party, every one of whom seemed to possess a monopoly of some particular portion of physiognomy. With the lady in question, this portion proved to be the mouth. Commencing at the right ear, it swept with a terrific chasm to the left, the short pendants which she wore in either oracle continually bobbing into the aperture. What, in her nose? No, not either. Oracle. I assumed it would be her ears. Yeah. Ooh, so her mouth is like that far. Eh, so she's got bobbles in her ears that keep swinging into her mouth. The short pendants which she wore in either oracle continually bobbing into the aperture. She made, however, every exertion to keep her mouth closed and looked dignified in a dress consisting of a newly starched and ironed shroud coming up close under her chin with a crimpled ruffle of cambric muslin. So we got forehead and mouth. At her right hand sat a diminutive young lady whom she appeared to patronize. This delicate little creature, in the trembling of her wasted fingers, in the livid hue of her lips, and in the slight hectic spot which tinged her otherwise leaden complexion, gave evident indications of a galloping consumption. An air of extreme hot pong, which is French for something, high tone, an air of extreme high tone, however, pervaded her whole appearance. She wore, in a graceful and dégagé manner, a large and beautiful winding sheet of the finest Indian lawn. Her hair hung in ringlets over her neck. A soft smile played about her mouth, but her nose, extremely long, thin, sinuous, flexible, and pimpled, hung down far below her under lip, and in spite of the delicate manner in which she now and then moved it to one side or the other with her tongue, gave to her countenance a somewhat equivocal expression. Over against her and upon the left of the dropsical lady was seated a little puffy, wheezing, and gouty old man, 
whose cheeks reposed upon the shoulders of their owner like two huge bladders of a porto wine. With his arms folded and with one bandaged leg deposited upon the table, he seemed to think himself entitled to some consideration. He evidently prided himself much upon every inch of his personal appearance, but took more special delight in calling attention to his gaudy-colored surtout. A greatcoat. This, to say the truth, must have cost him no little money, and was made to fit him exceedingly well, being fashioned from one of the curiously embroidered silken covers appertaining to those glorious escutcheons which, in England and elsewhere, are customarily hung up, in some conspicuous place, upon the dwellings of departed aristocracy. Next to him, and at the right hand of the president, was a gentleman in long white hose and cotton drawers. His frame shook in a ridiculous manner with a fit of what Tarpaulin called the horrors. His jaws, which had been newly shaved, were tightly tied up by a bandage of muslin, and his arms, being fastened in a similar way at the wrists, prevented him from helping himself get away, darn it, sorry, uh, and his arms fast, being fastened in a similar way at the wrists, prevented him, preve that, prevented him from helping himself too freely. Oh, okay, sorry, I thought my mic wasn't going. Uh, okay, and his arms, being fastened in a similar way at the wrists, prevented him from helping himself too freely to the liquors upon the table, a precaution rendered necessary, in the opinion of legs, by the peculiarly sottish and wine-bibbing cast of his visage, a pair of prodigious ears, nevertheless, which it was no doubt found impossible to confine, towered away into the atmosphere of the apartment, and were occasionally pricked up in a spasm at the sound of the drawing of a cork. Fronting him, sixthly and lastly, so we had forehead, we had mouth, cheeks, nose, and ears. Okay. Fronting him, sixthly and lastly, was situated a singularly stiff-looking personage who, being afflicted with paralysis, must, to speak seriously, have felt very ill at ease in his unaccommodating habiliments. He was habited, somewhat uniquely, in a new and handsome mahogany coffin. Its top or headpiece pressed upon the skull of the wearer and extended over it in the fashion of a hood, giving to the entire face an air of indescribable interest. Armholes had been cut in the sides, for the sake not more of elegance than of convenience. But the dress, nevertheless, prevented its proprietor from sitting as erect as his associates, and as he lay reclining against his trestle, at an angle of forty-five degrees, a pair of huge goggle eyes rolled up their awful whites towards the ceiling in absolute amazement at their own enormity. Before each of the party lay a portion of a skull, which was used as a drinking cup. Overhead was suspended a human skeleton by means of a rope tied round one of the legs and fastened to a ring in the ceiling. The other limb, confined by no such fetter, stuck off from the body at right angles, causing the whole loose and rattling frame to dangle and twirl about at the caprice of every occasional puff of wind which found its way into the apartment. In the cranium of this hideous thing lay a quantity of ignited charcoal, which threw a fitful but vivid light over the entire scene. While coffins and other wares appertaining to the shop of an undertaker were piled high up around the room and against the windows, preventing any ray from escaping into the street. At sight of this extraordinary assembly, and of their still more extraordinary paraphernalia, our two seamen did not conduct themselves with that degree of decorum which might have been expected. Legs, leaning against the wall near which he happened to be standing, dropped his lower jaw still lower than usual, and spread open his eyes to their fullest extent, while Hugh Tarpaulin, stooping down so as to bring his nose upon a level with the table, and spreading out a palm upon either knee, burst into a long, loud, and obstreperous roar of very ill-timed and immoderate laughter. Without, however, taking offense at behavior so excessively rude, the tall president smiled very graciously upon the intruders, nodded to them in a dignified manner with his head of sable plumes, and arising, took each by an arm, and led him to a seat which some others of the company had placed in the meantime for his accommodation. Legs to all this offered not the slightest resistance, but sat down as he was directed, while the gallant Hugh, removing his coffin trestle from its station near the head of the table, to the vicinity of the little consumptive lady in the winding sheet, plumped down by her side in high glee, 
and pouring out a skull of red wine, quaffed it to their better acquaintance. But at this presumption, the stiff gentleman in the coffin seemed exceedingly nettled, and serious consequences might have ensued had not the president rapping upon the table with his truncheon, the thigh bone, diverted the attention of all pre present to the following speech. It becomes our duty upon the present happy occasion. Avast there, interrupted Legs, looking very serious. Avast there a bit, I say, and tell us who the devil ye all are, and what business ye have here, rigged off like the foul fiends, and swilling the snug blue ruins stowed away for the winter by my honest shipmate, Will Wimble the Undertaker. At this unpardonable piece of ill breeding, all the original company half started to their feet, and uttered the same rapid succession of wild, fiendish shrieks which had before caught the attention of the seamen. The president, however, was the first to recover his composure, and at length, turning to legs with great dignity, recommenced. Most willingly wi will we gratify any reasonable curiosity on the part of guests so illustrious, unbidden though they be. Know then that in these dominions I am monarch, and here rule with undivided empire, under the title of King Pest the First. This apartment, which you no doubt profanely suppose to be the shop of Will Wimble the Undertaker, a man whom we know not, and whose plebeian appellation, has never before this night thwarted our royal ears. This apartment, I say, is the day's chamber of our palace, devoted to the councils of our kingdom, and to other sacred and lofty purposes. The noble lady who sits opposite is Queen Pest, our serene consort. The other exalted personages whom you behold are all of our family, and wear the insignia of the blood royal under the respective titles of His Grace the Archduke Pestiferous, His Grace the Duke Pestilential, His Grace the Duke Tempest, and Her Serene Highness the Archduchess, the Archduchess Anna Pest. As regards, continued he, your demand of the business upon which we sit here in council, we might be pardoned for replying that it concerns, and concerns alone, our own private and regal interest, and is in no manner important to any other than ourself. But in consideration of those rights to which as guests and strangers you may feel yourselves entitled, we will furthermore explain that we are here this night, prepared by deep research and accurate investigation, to examine, analyze, and thoroughly determine the indefinable spirit, the incomprehensible qualities and nature, of those inestimable treasures of the palate, the wines, ales, and liqueurs of this goodly metropolis, by so doing to advance not more our own designs than the true welfare of that unearthly sovereign whose reign is over us all, whose dominions are unlimited, and whose name is Death. Whose name is Davy Jones, ejaculated Tarpaulin, helping the lady by his side to a skull of liqueur and pouring out a second for himself. Profane varlet, that's a good word too. No, not that one. I mean, that one is too. Ah, oh, it doesn't tell me. Said the president, now turning his attention to the worthy Hugh. Profane and, and execrable. Uh, oh my goodness. Profane and execrable. Oh my gosh, hang on. Execrable. 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 It's a tongue twister in and of itself. Profane and execrable wretch, we have said that in consideration of those rights which, even in thy filthy person, we feel no inclination to violate, we have condescended to make reply to thy rude and unseasonable inquiries. We nevertheless, for your unhallowed intrusion upon our counsels, believe it our duty to mullet thee and thy... Oops, sorry. Mullet thee and thy companion in each a gallon of black strap, having imbibed which to the prosperity of our kingdom at a single draught, and upon your bended knees, ye shall be forthwith free either to proceed upon your way, or remain and be admitted to the privileges of our table, according to your respective and individual pleasures. It would be a matter of utter impossibility, replied Legs, whom the assumptions and dignity of King Pest I had evidently inspired with some feeling of respect, and who arose and steadied himself by the table as he spoke. It would, please your majesty, be a matter of utter impossibility to stow away in my hold even one-fourth part of that same liquor which your majesty has just mentioned. 
to say nothing of the stuffs placed on board in the forenoon by way of ballast, and not to mention the various ales and liqueurs shipped this evening at various seaports, I have, at present, a full cargo of humming stuff taken in and duly paid for, no it wasn't, at the sign of the Jolly Tar. You will, therefore, please your majesty, be so good as to take the will for the deed, for by no manner of means either can I or will I swallow another drop, least of all a drop of that villainous bilge water that answers to the hail of Blackstrap. Belay that, interrupted Tarpaulin, astonished not more at the length of his companion's speech than at the nature of his refusal. Belay that, you lubber, and I say legs none of your palaver. My hull is still light, although I confess you yourself seem to be a little top-heavy, and as for the matter of your share of the cargo, why, rather than raise a squall, I would find stowage room for it myself, but this proceeding, interposed the president, is by no means in accordance with the terms of the mullet or sentence, which is in its nature median, and not to be altered or recalled. The conditions we have imposed must be fulfilled to the letter, and that without a moment's hesitation. In failure of which fulfillment we decree that you do here be tied neck and heels together and duly drowned as rebels in yon hogshead of October beer. A sentence, a sentence, a righteous and just sentence, a glorious decree, a most worthy and upright and holy condemnation, shouted the Pest family together, all together. The king elevated his forehead into innumerable wrinkles. The gouty little old man puffed like a pair of bellows. The lady of the winding sheet waved her nose to and fro. The gentleman in the cotton drawers pricked up his ears. She of the shroud gasped like a dying fish, and he of the coffin looked stiff and rolled up his eyes. Ugh, 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 chuckled Tarpaulin. Oh, he's chuckling, without heeding the general excitation. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was saying, said he, I was saying when Mr. King Pest poked in his marlin spike, that as for the matter of two or three gallons, more or less, of black strap, it was a trifle to a tight sea boat like myself, not overstowed. But when it comes to drinking the health of the devil, whom God assoils, assoils, assoilsy? I almost feel like it should be assoilized interesting, whom God something, and going down upon my marrow bones to his ill-favored majesty there, whom I know as well as I know myself, to be a sinner, to be nobody in the whole world, but Tim Hurley Gurley, the stage player. Why, it's quite another guess sort of a thing, and utterly and altogether past my comprehension. He was not allowed to finish this speech in tranquility. At the name of Tim Hurley Gurley, the whole assembly leaped from their seats. Treason, shouted his majesty, King Pest I. Treason, said the little man with the gout. Treason, screamed the archduchess, Anna Pest. Treason, muttered the gentleman with his jaws tied up. Treason, growled he of the coffin. Treason, treason, shrieked her majesty of the mouth. And, seizing by the hinder part of his breeches, the unfortunate tarpaulin, who had just commenced pouring out for himself a skull of liqueur, she lifted him high into the air and let him fall without ceremony into the huge open puncheon of his beloved ale. Bobbing up and down for a few seconds, like an apple in a bowl of toddy, he at length finally disappeared amid the whirlpool of foam which, in the already effervescent li liquor, his struggles easily succeeded in creating. Not tamely, however, did the tall sea man behold the discomfiture of his companion. Jocelyn King Pest through the open trap, the valiant leg slammed the door down upon him with an oath and strode towards the center of the room. Here, tearing down the skeleton which swung over the table, he laid it about him with so much energy and goodwill that, as the last glimpses of light died away within the apartment, he succeeded in knocking out the brains of the little gentleman with the gout. Rushing then with all his force against the fatal hogshead full of October ale and Hugh Tarpaulin, he rolled it over and over in an instant. Out burst a deluge of liquor so fierce, so impetuous, so overwhelming, that the room was flooded from wall to wall, the loaded table was overturned, the trestles were thrown upon their backs, the tub of punch into the fireplace, and the ladies into hysterics. Piles of death furniture floundered about, jugs, pitchers, and carboys mingled promiscuously in the melee, and wicker flagons encountered desperately with bottles of junk. The man with the horrors was drowned upon the spot, 
the little stiff gentleman floated off in his coffin, and the victorious legs, seizing by the waist the fat lady in the shroud, rushed out with her into the street and made a bee line for the free and easy, followed under easy sail by the redoubtable Hugh Tarpaulin, who, having sneezed three or four times, panted and puffed after him with the Archduchess Anna Pest. What? <laughs> okay, so there was an allegory there. There was a lot of references to ships and seafaring, as well as alcohol and pestilence. So, I'm assuming, just from initial analysis of it, that drunkenly, of course, yes, they, ooh, also potentially has to do with, well, potentially not. We're going to set that aside. Um, they stumble into somewhere they're not supposed to be and uh, have a drunken encounter and they run off with the pestilence. So they're going to die anyway uh, because all of those represented pestilence. And I'm sure there's more to it than that. But, oh, I did. I enjoyed that very much. I, I liked the... Um, the kind of contrast or the melding of the humor with the absolute grotesque imagery, which is so much fun and Poe does so well. <laughs> Cause and it, I don't, on one hand, I want to say it's, it's subtly, it's subtly written, but in such a way that it's vivid. If that makes sense, because again, a lot of stuff nowadays it tries to be over dramatic in order to, um, in order to induce those feelings, which you don't need, and often kind of backfires by being too much. But his is just it. It is. It's just it's so good, and like again, the contrast with the humor of it. Very good. So good. Oh. And at one point, I was also, the, um, when Tarpaulin was popped into the punch barrel, I guess, um, how many times, again, looking at it as less allegory and more, um, realistic, I guess, um, just from that point of a view, how many times have they tossed somebody in there and they're still drinking from it? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yes, it's, what was it? Um, liquor flavored with human flesh. Wonderful. Delightful. Delicious. Uh, that will sell very well. Alright, we're gonna move on. Three Sundays in a week. <laughs> yes, that was. That was... I don't want to say... I don't want to say typical poll. T typical poll. Uh -huh. Typical Poe, but it is. The grotesque is what he's known for, and I'm, there's a reason for that. It's just that good. So this is Three Sundays. That was King Pest, which again, fitting for the time we are in. This is Three Sundays in a Week. I believe when I was reading through it, it was... There's like paranoia. Paranoia, and there's something about uh, man in the crowd that sort of idea. Uh, so we shall see. Oh, and again, sorry, one more thing, going back to the, I guess, allegory, I would assume that that would have, that would be, I guess, the allegory of, uh, the dangers of drinking, I would think. Um, but, There's, there's also something to do with the facial features. So it was the it was the forehead, it was the ears, the mouth, the cheeks, the nose, the eyes. I don't know. That'd be something that I'd have to think about a little bit more. <laughs> there's the little tickle. Mm. All right, continuing with three Sundays in a week. Ahem. You hard-hearted, dunder-headed, obstinate, rusty, crusty, musty, fusty, old savage. What a way to start a story. 
said I, in fancy, one afternoon, to my grand uncle Rumgudgeon, shaking my, fir my fist at him in imagination. Only in imagination. The fact is, some trivial discrepancy did exist just then between what I said and what I had not the courage to say, between what I did and what I had half a mind to do. I think this one, sorry, this is not the one with the paranoia and man in the crowd. This one is, uh, he wants to marry his cousin, which was normal at that time, and his grand uncle is not allowing him. Uh, and I'm not sure. And he, uh, this uncle of Rumgudgeon does something tricky. So it's about trickery and attempted romance. <laughs> the old porpoise, as I opened the drawing room door, was sitting with his feet upon the mantelpiece and a bumper of port in his paw, making strenuous efforts to accomplish the ditty. Uh, mm. Fill your empty glass, empty your full glass. Nice, okay. Kind of want to remember that one as well. Remplis ton verre vide, 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 vide ton verre plein. <laughs> I tried, I tried very hard. I'm working on it. My dear uncle, said I, closing the door gently and approaching him with the blandest of smiles, you are always so very kind and considerate and have evinced your benevolence in so many, so very many ways that, that I feel I have only to suggest this little point to you once more to make sure of your full acquiescence. Hep, he said, said he. Good boy, go on. I am sure, my dearest uncle, you confounded old rascal, that you have no design, really, seriously, to oppose my union with Kate. This is merely a joke of yours, I know. Ha ha ha. How very pleasant you are at times. Ha ha ha, said he. Curse you, yes. To be sure, of course, I knew you were jesting. Now, uncle, all that Kate and myself wish at present is that you would oblige us with your advice as, as regards the time. You know, you know, uncle. In short, when will it be most convenient for yourself that the wedding shall, shall come off, you know? Come off, you scoundrel. What do you mean by that? Better wait till it goes on. <laughs> oh, that's good. Oh, that's capital. Such a wit. But all we want just now, you know, uncle, is that you would indicate the time precisely. Ah, precisely? Yes, uncle. That is, if it would be quite agreeable to yourself. Wouldn't it answer, Bobby, if I were to leave it at random? Sometime within a year or so, for example? Must I say precisely? If you please, uncle, precisely. Well then, Bobby, my boy, you're a fine fellow, aren't you? Since you will have the exact time, I'll, why, I'll oblige you for once. Dear uncle, hush, sir, drowning my voice. I'll oblige you for once. You shall have my consent. And the plum, we mustn't forget the plum. Let me see, when shall it be? Today's Sunday, isn't it? Well then, you shall be married precisely, precisely now, mind, when three Sundays come together in a week. Do you hear me, sir? What are you gaping at? I say you shall have Kate and her plum. Oh, <laughs> when three Sundays come together in a week. But not till then, you young scapegrace. Mischievous or wayward person, nice. Not till then if I die for it. You know me, I'm a man of my word. Now be off. Here he swallowed his bumper of port while I rushed from the room in despair. A very fine old English gentleman was my grand-uncle, Rumgudgeon, but unlike him of the song, he had his weak points. He was a little pursy, pompous, passionate, semi-circular somebody, with a red nose, a thick skull, a long purse, and a strong sense of his own consequence. With the best heart in the world, he contrived through a predominant whim of contradiction to earn for himself, among those who only knew him superficially, the character of a curmudgeon. Like many excellent people, he seemed possessed with a spirit of tantalization, which might easily, at a casual glance, have been mistaken for malevolence. To every request, a positive no was his immediate answer. But in the end, in the long, long end, there were exceedingly few requests which he refused. Against all attacks upon his purse, he made the most sturdy defense. 
but the amount extorted from him at last was, generally, in direct ratio with the length of the siege and the stubbornness of the resistance. In charity, no one gave more liberally or with a worse grace. For the fine arts, and especially for the belles lettres, he entertained a profound contempt. With this, he had been inspired by Casimir Perrier, whose pert little query, oops, uh, is he good? What is a poet banished from? What a poet is Carol Bond. What is a poet? Okay. With this, he, okay, for the fine arts, and especially for the beautiful letters, he entertained a profound contempt. With this, he had been inspired by Casimir Perrier, whose pert little query, what is a poet banished from? He, shoot, he was in the habit, go away, he was in the habit, I've lost my place, he was in the habit of quoting with a very droll pronunciation as the new plus, plus ultra, no longer, uh, new, no longer best, as the new plus, yeah, no longer best with a very drawl pronunciation as the no longer best of logical wit. Ah, go away. Thus my own inkling for the muses had excited his entire displeasure. He assured me one day, when I asked him for a new copy of Horace, that the translation of uh, poets born not fit, a poet is born, it does not take place, was a nasty poet, wait, hang on, he assured me one day, when I asked him for a new copy of Horace, that the translation of this was a nasty poet for nothing fit, a remark which I took in high dudgeon. His repugnance to the humanities had, also much increased of late, by an accidental bias in favor of what he supposed to be natural science. Somebody had accosted him in the street, mistaking him for no less a personage than Dr. Double L.D., the lecturer upon quack physics. This set him off at a tangent. And just at the epic of this story, for story it is getting to be after all, my grand uncle Rumgudgeon was accessible and pacific only upon points which happened to chime in with the caprioles of the hobby he was riding. For the rest, he laughed with his arms and legs, and his politics were stubborn and easily understood. He thought, with hoarsely, that the people have nothing to do with the laws but to obey them. I had lived with the old gentleman all my life. My parents, in dying, had bequeathed me to him as a rich legacy. I believe the old villain loved me as his own child, nearly, if not quite as well as he loved Kate. But it was a dog's ex it was a dog's existence that he led me. After all, after all, from my first year until my fifth, he obliged me with very regular floggings. From five to fifteen, he threatened me hourly with the house of correction. From fifteen to twenty, not a day passed in which he did not promise to cut me off with a shilling. I was a sad dog, it is true, but then it was a part of my nature, a point of my fate. In Kate, however, I had a firm friend, and I knew it. She was a good girl, and told me very sweetly that I might have her, plum and all, whenever I could badger my grand-uncle Rumgudgeon into the necessary consent. Poor girl, she was barely fifteen, and without this consent, her little amount in the funds was not comatible until five immeasurable summers had dragged their slow length along. What then to do? At fifteen, or even at twenty-one, for I had now passed my fifth Olympiad. Ooh, I'm trying to remember that. Yeah, that would have been the twenty, right? I'm assuming. Fifth is... Wait, hang on. Fifth would be four years. Five times four is twenty. Yes. For I had now passed my fifth Olympiad. Five years... At fifteen, or even at twenty-one... Five years in prospect... Okay, at fifteen, or even at twenty-one, for I had now passed my fifth Olympiad, five years in prospect are very much the same as five hundred. In vain we besieged the, the old gentleman with importunities. Here was a piece of resistance. Yes, that's perfect. As Messieurs uh, Oud and Corinne would say, which suited his perverse fancy to a T. It would have stirred the indignation of Job himself to see how much like an old mouser he behaved to us two poor, wretched little mice. In his heart he wished for nothing more ardently than our union. He had made up his mind to this all along. In fact, he would have given ten thousand pounds from his own pocket. Kate's plum was her own. If he could have invented- Hang on, am I, am I reading this incorrectly? 
this kind of makes it seem like it's her, um, her, uh, b -b 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 a bride price. Which, um, sure, I was thinking it was something else, which, in fact, who would have given 10,000 pounds? I'm gonna quick see if there's anything. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. A thing could be a job, could something could be highly desirable? It could be her giving her own bride price, but I'm thinking it's something else. So we're going to just kind of move along past it. In fact, he would have given 10,000 pounds from his own pocket, Kate's plum was her own, if he could have invented anything like an excuse for complying with our very natural wishes. But then we had been so imprudent as to broach the subject ourselves. Not to oppose it under such circumstances, I sincerely believe was not in his power. I have said already that he had his weak points, but in speaking of these, I must not be understood as referring to his obstinacy, which was one of his strong points. Da, 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 da. Of course it was not his weakness, which was one of his strong points. Of course it was not his weakness. When I mention his weakness, I have allusion to a bizarre old womanish superstition which beset him. He was great in dreams, portents, and, uh, and all of that kind of rigmarole. He was excessively punctilious, too, upon small points of honor, and after his own fashion, was a man of his word. Beyond doubt, this was, in fact, one of his hobbies. The spirit of his vows he made no scruple of setting at naught, but the letter was a bond inviolable. Now it was this latter peculiarity in his disposition, of which Kate's ingenuity enabled us one fine day, not long after our interview in the dining room, to take a very unexpected advantage. And having thus, in the fashion of all modern bards and orators, exhausted in prolegomena, uh, prolegomenon, 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 a critical or discursive introduction to a book, exhausted, oh, in the beginning, <laughs> and having thus, in the fashion of all modern bards and orators, exhausted in prolegomenon, prolegomena, all the time at my command, and nearly all the room at my disposal, I will sum up in a few words what constitutes the whole pith of the story. It happened then, so the fates ordered it, that among the naval acquaintances of my betrothed were two gentlemen who had just set foot upon the shores of England, after a year's absence each in foreign travel. In company with these gentlemen, my cousin and I, preconcertedly, paid Uncle Rumgudgeon a visit on the afternoon of Sunday, October the 10th just three weeks after the memorable decision which had so cruelly defeated our hopes. For about half an hour, the conversation ran upon ordinary topics, but at last we contrived, quite naturally, to give it the following turn. Captain Pratt. Well, I have been absent just one year, just one year today as I live. Let me see. Yes, this is October the 10th. You remember, Mr. Rumgudgeon, I called this day, this day year, to bid you goodbye. And by the way, it does seem something like a coincidence, does it not, that our friend Captain Smitherton here has been absent exactly a year also, a year today? Smitherton. Yes, just one year to a fraction. You will remember, Mr. Rumgudgeon, that I called with Captain Cratol on this very day last year to pay my parting respects. Uncle. Yes, 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 I remember it very well, very queer indeed, both of you gone just one year, a very strange coincidence, indeed. Just what Dr. Double L.D. Would, de would denominate an extraordinary concurrence of events. Dr. Dub... Kate, interrupting. To be sure, Papa, it is something strange. But then Captain Pratt and Captain Smitherton didn't go altogether the same route, and that makes a difference, you know. Uncle. I don't know any such thing, you huzzy. How should I? I think it only makes the matter more remarkable. Dr. Double L.D. Kate. Why, Papa, Captain Pratt went round Cape Horn, and Captain Smitherton doubled the Cape of Good Hope. Uncle, precisely. The one went east and the other went west, you jade, and they both have gone quite round the world. By the by, Dr. Double L.D., myself, hurriedly, Captain Pratt, you must come and spend the evening with us tomorrow. You and Smitherton, you can tell us all about your voyage, and we'll have a game of whist, and... Pratt, whist, my dear fellow, you, forgot, you forget. Tomorrow will be Sunday. Some other some other evening. Oh no, fiend. Robert's not quite so bad as that. Today's Sunday. Uncle, to be sure, to be sure. Uh, Pratt, 
I beg both your pardons, but I can't be so much mistaken. I know tomorrow's Sunday because... Smitherton, much surprised. What are you all thinking about? Wasn't yesterday Sunday, I should like to know? All, yesterday indeed. You are out. Uncle, today's Sunday, I say. Don't I know? Pratt, oh no, tomorrow's Sunday. Smitherton, you are all mad, every one of you. I am as positive that yesterday was Sunday as I am that I sit upon this chair. Kate, jumping up eagerly. I see it. I see it all. Papa, this is a judgment upon you, about... About you know what. Let me alone and I'll explain it all in a minute. It's a very simple thing indeed. Captain Smitherton says that yesterday was Sunday, so it was. He is right. Cousin Bobby and Uncle and I say that today is Sunday, so it is. We are right. Captain Pratt maintains that tomorrow will be Sunday, so it will. He is right too. The fact is, we are all right and thus three Sundays have come together in a week. Smitherton, after a pause, by the by, Pratt, Kate has us completely. What fools we two are. Mr. Rumgudgeon, the matter stands thus. The earth, you know, is 24,000 miles in circumference. Now this globe of the earth turns upon its own axis, revolves, spins round these 24,000 miles of extent, going from west to east in precisely 24 hours. Do you understand, Mr. Rumgudgeon? <laughs> Uncle. To be sure, to be sure. Dr. Dub Smitherton drowning his voice. Well, sir, that is at the rate of 1,000 miles per hour. Now, suppose that I sail from this position 1,000 miles east. Of course, I anticipate the rising of the sun here at London by just one hour. I see the sun rise one hour before you do, proceeding in the same direction, yet another 1,000 miles. Sorry. <clears throat> I see the sun rise one hour before you do. Proceeding in the same direction, yet another thousand miles, I anticipate the rising by two hours, another thousand, and I anticipate it by three hours, and so on, until I go entirely round the globe, and back to this spot, when, having gone twenty-four thousand miles east, I anticipate the rising of the London sun by no less than twenty-four hours. That is to say, I am a day in advance of your time. Understand, eh? Uncle. But double L.D., Smitherton, speaking very loud. Captain Pratt, on the contrary, when he had sailed a thousand miles west of this position, was an hour. And when he had sailed 24,000 miles west, was 24 hours, or one day, behind the time at London. Thus with me, yesterday was Sunday. Thus with you, today is Sunday. And thus with Pratt, tomorrow will be Sunday. And what is more, Mr. Rumgudgeon, it is positively clear that we are all right. For they can, there can be no philosophical reason assigned why the idea of one of us should have preference over that of the other. Uncle. My eyes. Well, Kate. Well, Bobby. This is a judgment upon me, as you say. But I am a man of my word. Mark that. You shall have her, boy. Plum and all. When you please. Done up by Jove. Three Sundays all in a row. I'll go and take double LD's opinion upon that. Oh, that was fun. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of obvious after the fact now, but that was that was an interesting way of going about it. And there it was. There was the romance. Um, little more than romance <laughs> in part of it. And a little curmudgeon and science. So, yeah. Wonderful Poe. Wonderful Poe. The devil in the belfry. And less Poe-like than one might expect. Mm. So that was three Sundays in a week. The Devil in the Belfry. I do not remember reading about this one. I did, but yeah, we'll just see how it goes. So the Devil in the Belfry. What o'clock is it? An old saying. Very old. Everybody knows, in a general way, that the finest place in the world is or alas, was the Dutch borough of van der Vatimitis. I apologize for the butchering of that pronunciation. Yet, as it lies some distance from any of the main roads, being in a somewhat out-of-the-way situation, there are perhaps very few of my readers who have ever paid it a visit. For the benefit of those who have not, therefore, it will be only proper that I should enter into some account of it. And this is, indeed, the more necessary, as with the hope of enlisting public sympathy in behalf of the inhabitants. I design here to give a history of the calamitous events which have so lately occurred within its limits. No one who knows me will doubt that the duty thus self-imposed 
will be executed to the best of my ability, with all that rigid impartiality, all that cautious examination into facts, and diligent collation of authorities, which should ever distinguish him who aspires to the title of historian. By the united aid of medals, manuscripts, and inscriptions, I am enabled to say positively that the borough of, oh gosh, von der Votimitis, von, von der Votimit, sorry, von der Votimitis, has existed from its origin in precisely the same condition which it at present preserves. Of the date of this origin, however, I grieve that I can only speak with that species of indefinite de with that species of indefinite definiteness which mathematicians are, at times, forced to put up with in certain algebraic formulae. The date, I may thus say, in regard to the remoteness of its antiquity, cannot be less than any assignable quantity whatsoever. Touching the derivation of the name of von der Votimitis, I confess myself with sorrow equally at fault. Among a multitude of opinions upon this delicate point, some acute, some learned, some sufficiently the reverse, I am able to select nothing which ought to be considered satisfactory. Perhaps the idea of Grogswig, uh, Grogsvig, nearly coincident with that of, oh, good lord, crowd a, pl crowd a plenty is to be cautiously preferred. Grogswig. Like a swig of grog. Okay. Vonder Vatan. Are these legitimate names or are they made up? Perhaps the idea of Grogswig, nearly coincident with that of Crowd a Plenty, is to be cautiously preferred. It runs Vonder Vatimatis. Oh my gosh, I just got it. <laughs> I wonder what time it is. Vonder Leg Donder. Okay, hang on. Vonder Vatimatis. Vonder Leg Donder, not sure what that one is. What time it is? What? Or is this? Are, I still don't know if they're legitimate or not. Quasi and blitzes. Quasi and quasi and blitzes. Blitzes of soul. Pro blitzen. I feel like some of those are real and some of them aren't. This derivation, to say the truth, is still countenanced by some traces of the electric fluid evident on the summit of the steeple of the house of the town council. I do not choose, however, to commit myself on a theme of such importance, and must refer the reader desirous of information to the Oratiunculi de Rubus Prater Viteris of Dunderguts. See also Blunderbuzzard de Derivationibus. Pages 27 to 5010. Folio, Gothic edition. Red and black character, catchword, and no cipher. Wherein consult also marginal notes in the autograph of Stuff and Puff with the sub commentaries of Grunt and Guzzle. I'm thinking this is the more one of the more humorous stories and troll stories of Pole, which I enjoy very much. Notwithstanding the obscurity which thus envelops the date of the foundation of Vandervatimitis and the derivation of its name, there can be no doubt, as I said before, that it has always existed as we find it at this epoch. The oldest man in the borough cannot... Sorry. <clears throat> the oldest man in the borough can remember not the slightest difference in the appearance of any portion of it. And indeed, the very suggestion of such a possibility is considered an insult. The site of the village is in a perfectly circular valley, about a quarter of a mile in circumference, and entirely surrounded by gentle hills, over whose summit the people have never yet ventured to pass. For this they assign the very good reason that they do not believe there is anything at all on the other side. Round, round the skirts of the valley, which is quite level and paved throughout with flat tiles, extends a continuous row of 60 little houses. Might that be 60 minutes? These, having their backs on the hills, must look, of course, to the center of the plain, which is just 60 yards from the front door of each dwelling. Every house has a small garden before it, with a circular path, a sundial, and 24 cabbages. The buildings themselves are so precisely alike that one can in no manner be distinguished from the other. Owing to the vast antiquity, the style of architecture is somewhat odd, but it is not for that reason the less strikingly picturesque. 
They are fashioned of hard-burned little bricks, red with black ends, so that the walls look like a chessboard upon a great scale. The gables are turned to the front, and there are cornices, as big as all the rest of the house, over the eaves and over the main doors. The windows are narrow and deep, with very tiny panes and a great deal of sash. On the roof is a vast quantity of tiles with long, curly ears. The woodwork throughout is of a dark hue, and there is much carving about it, with but a trifling variety of pattern. For time out of mind, the carvers of Wundervatime it is, have never been able to carve more than two objects, a timepiece and a cabbage. But these they do exceedingly well, and intersperse them with singular ingenuity, whenever they find room for the chisel. The dwellings are as much alike inside as out, and the furniture is all upon one plan. The floors are of square tiles, the chairs and tables of black-looking wood, with thin crooked legs and puppy feet. The mantelpieces are wide and high, and have not only timepieces and cabbages sculptured over the front, but a real timepiece, which makes a prodigious ticking, on the top in the middle, with a flower pot containing a cabbage standing on each extremity by way of outrider. Between each cabbage and the timepiece, again, is a little Chinaman having a large stomach with a great round hole in it, through which is seen the dial plate of a watch. The fireplaces are large and deep, with fierce, crooked-looking fire dogs. There is constantly a rousing fire and a huge pot over it, full of sauerkraut and pork, to which the good woman of the house is always busy in attending. She is a little fat old lady with blue eyes and a red face, and wears a huge cap like a sugar loaf ornamented with purple and yellow ribbons. Her dress is of orange-colored linsey woolsey, made very full behind and very short in the waist, and indeed very short in other respects, not reaching below the middle of her leg. This is somewhat thick, and so are her ankles, but she has a fine pair of green stockings to cover them. Her shoes of pink leather are fastened each with a bunch of yellow ribbons puckered up in the shape of a cabbage. In her left hand, she has a little Dutch, heavy Dutch watch. In her right, she wields a ladle for the sauerkraut and pork. By her side, there stands a fat tabby cat with a gilt toy repeater tied to its tail, which the boys have there fastened by way of a quiz. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry. The boys themselves are, all three of them, in the garden attending the pig. They are each two feet in height. They have three cornered cocked hats, purple waistcoats reaching down to their thighs, buckskin knee breeches, red woolen stockings, heavy shoes with big silver buckles, and long surtout coats with large buttons of mother of pearl. Each two has a pipe in his mouth and a little dumpy watch in his right hand. He takes a puff and a look, and then a look and a puff. The pig, which is corpulent and lazy, is occupied now in picking up the stray leaves that fall from the cabbages, and now in giving a kick behind at the gilt repeater, which the urchins have also tied to his tail in order to make him look as handsome as the cat. Right at the front door, in a high-backed, leather-bottomed armed chair, with crooked legs and puppy feet like the tables, is seated the old man of the house himself. He is an exceedingly puffy little old gentleman, with big circular eyes and a huge double chin. His dress resembles that of the boys, and I need say nothing farther about it. All the difference is that his pipe is somewhat bigger than theirs, and he can make a greater smoke. Sorry. Like them, he has a watch, but he carries his watch in his pocket. To say the truth, he has something of more importance than a watch to attend to, and what that is I shall presently explain. He sits with his right leg upon his left knee, wears a grave countenance, and always keeps one of his eyes, at least, resolutely bent upon a certain remarkable object in the center of the plain. This object is situated in the steeple of the house of the town council. The town council, council are all very little, round, oily, intelligent men, with big saucer eyes and fat double chins, and have their coats much longer, and their shoe buckles much bigger than the ordinary inhabitants of Vandervatimatis. Since my sojourn in the borough, they have had several special meetings and have adopted these three important resolutions. That it is wrong to alter the good old course of things, that there is nothing tolerable out of Vandervatime it is, and that we will stick by our clocks and our cabbages. Above the session room of the council is the steeple, and in the steeple is the belfry, where it where exists and has existed time out of mind, the pride and wonder of the village, the great clock of the borough of Vandervatime it is. 
and this is the object to which the eyes of the old gentlemen are turned who sit in the leather-bottomed armchairs. The great clock has seven faces, one in each of the seven sides of the steeples, so that it can be readily seen from all quarters. Its faces are large and white, and its hands heavy and black. There is a belfry man whose sole duty is to attend to it, but this duty is the most perfect of sinecures, for the clock of Vandervatimitis was never yet known to have anything the matter with it. Until lately, the bare supposition of such a thing was considered heretical. From the remotest period of antiquity, to which the archives have reference, the hours have been regularly struck by the big bell, and indeed the case was just the same with all the other clocks and watches in the borough. Never was such a place for keeping the true time. When the large clapper thought proper to say twelve o'clock, all its obedient followers opened their throats simultane simultaneously and responded like a very echo. In short, the good burghers were fond of their sauerkraut, but then they were proud of their clocks. All people who hold sinecure offices are held in more or less respect, and as the belfry man of, one of Van der Vatimitis has the most perfect of sinecures, he is the most perfectly respected of any man in the world. I've just got to make sure that I'm saying that correctly. Sinecure. 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 Perfect of sinecures. He is the most perfectly respected of any man in the world. He is the chief dignitary of the borough, and the very pigs look up to him with a sentiment of reverence. His coattail is very far longer, his pipe, his shoe buckles, his eyes, and his stomach very far bigger than those of any other old gentleman in the village, and as to his chin, it is not only double, but triple. I have thus painted the happy estate of Vandervatimitis. Alas, that so fair a picture should ever experience a reverse. There has been long a saying among the wisest inhabitants that no good can come from over the hills, and it really seemed that the words had in them something of the spirit of prophecy. It wanted five minutes of noon on the day before yesterday, when there appeared a very odd-looking object on the summit of the ridge to the eastward. Such an occurrence, of course, attracted universal attention, and every little old gentleman who sat in a leather-bottomed armchair turned one of his eyes with a stare of dismay upon the phenomenon, still keeping the other upon the clock in the steeple. By the time that it wanted only three minutes to noon, the draw object... Did you say drawl or drawl? Drawl. 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 Drawl? Drawl. I think it's drawl. By the time that it wanted only three minutes to noon, the drawl object in question was perceived to be a very diminutive, foreign-looking young man. He descended the hills at a great rate, so that everybody had soon a good look at him. He was really the most finicky little personage that had, that had ever been seen in Vandervatimitis. His countenance was of a dark snuff box, and he had a long hooked nose, pea eyes, a wide mouth, and an excellent set of teeth, which latter he seemed anxious of displaying, as he was grinning from ear to ear. What with mustachios and whiskers, there was none of the rest of his face to be seen. His head was uncovered, and his hair neatly done up in papalotes, papillo, curls. His dress was a tight-fitting, swallow-tailed black coat, from one of whose pockets dangled a vast length of white handkerchief, black kerseymere knee breeches, black stockings, and stumpy-looking pumps, with huge bunches of black satin ribbon for bows. Under one arm he carried a huge chapeau de bras, and under the other a fiddle nearly five times as big as himself. In his left hand was a gold snuff box, from which, as he capered down the hill, cutting all manner of fantastical steps, he took snuff incessantly with an air of the greatest possible self-satisfaction. God bless me, here was a sight for the honest burghers of, von of Vondervat time it is. To speak plainly, the fellow had, in spite of his grinning, an audacious and sinister kind of face, and as he curveted right into the village, the odd stumpy appearance of his pumps excited no little suspicion. And many a burger who beheld him that day would have given a trifle for a peep beneath the white cambric handkerchief which hung so obtrusively from the pocket of his swallow-tailed coat. But what mainly occasioned a righteous indignation was that the scoundrelly popinjay, while he sat a fandango here and a whirligig there, did not seem to have the remotest idea in the world of such a thing as keeping time in his steps. Uh, the good at people of the borough had scarcely a chance, however, to get their eyes thoroughly open, when just as it wanted half a minute of noon, the rascal bounced, as I say, right into the midst of them, gave a chasse here, and a balancé there, and then after a pirouette and a pas de, 
Pot of Zephyr, Pigeon winged himself right up into the belfry of the House of the Town Council, where the wonder-stricken belfry man sat smoking in a state of dignity and dismay. But the little chap seized him at once by the nose, gave it a swing and a pull, clapped the big chapeau de bras upon a chapeau de bras upon his head, knocked it down over his eyes and mouth, and then, lifting up the big fiddle, beat him with it so long and so soundly that what with the belfry man being so fat and the fiddle being so hollow, you would have sworn that there was a regiment of double, bat, double bass drummers all beating the devil's tattoo up in the belfry of the steeple of Thunder Vatimatis. There is no knowing to what desperate act of vengeance this unprincipled attack might have aroused the inhabitants, but for the important fact that it now wanted only half a second of noon, the bell was about to strike, and it was a matter of absolute and preeminent necessity that everybody should look well at his watch. It was evident, however, that just at this moment, the fellow in the steeple was doing something that he had no business to do with the clock, but as it now began to strike, nobody had any time to attend to his maneuvers, for they had all to count the strokes of the bell as it sounded. One, said the clock. Thun, echoed every little old gentleman in every leather-bottomed armchair in Vundervatimatis. Thun, said his watch also. Thun, said the watch of his vrow. And Thun, said the watches of the boys. And the little gilt repeaters on the tails of the cat and pig. Vrow. Okay, sure. Uh, two, continued the big bell. And... Do, repeated all the repeaters. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, said the bell. <laughs> Three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, answered the others. Eleven, said the big one. Eleven, assented the little fellows. Twelve, said the bell. Twelve, they replied, perfectly satisfied, and dropping their voices. Un dwell, un... <laughs> Und welf it is, said all the little old gentlemen, putting up their watches, but the big bell had not done with them yet. Thirteen, said he. Der Tufel, gasped the little old gentleman. What does that mean? The devil, der Tufel, gasped the little old gentleman, turning pale, dropping their pipes and putting down all their right legs from over their left knees. Der Tufel, groaned they. Dirteen, dirteen. Mein Gott, it is dirteen o'clock. I apologize for the horrible accent. Why attempt to describe the terrible scene which ensued? All von der Vatimatis flew at once into a lamentable state of uproar. What is come to mein Pelly? roared all the boys. I've been hungry for this hour. What is come to mein Kraut? screamed all the vrows. It has been done to rags for this hour. What is come to mein Pipe? swore all the little old gentlemen. Donder and Blitzen. It has been smoked out for this hour. So are the reindeer named after curses? Why did I not know this? Donder and Blitzen. It has been smoked out for this hour. And they filled them up again in a great rage, and sinking back in their armchairs, puffed away so fast and so fiercely that the whole valley was immediately filled with impenetrable smoke. Meantime, the cabbages all turned very red in the face, and it seemed as if old Nick himself had taken possession of everything in the shape of a timepiece. Nick as in Satan? Oh, is that why in Supernatural they named him Nick? The clocks carved upon the furniture took to dancing as if bewitched, while those upon the mantelpieces could scarcely contain themselves for fury, and kept such a continual striking of thirteen, and such a frisking and wriggling of their pendulums as was really horrible to see. But, worse than all, neither the cats nor the pigs could put up any longer with the behavior of the little repeaters tied to their tails, and resented it by scampering all over the place, scratching and poking and squeaking and screeching and caterwauling and squalling and flying into the faces and running under the petticoats of the people and creating altogether the most abominable din and confusion which it is possible for a reasonable person to conceive. And to make matters still more distressing, the rascally little scapegrace in the steeple was evidently exerting himself to the utmost. Every now and then one might catch a glimpse of the scoundrel through the smoke. There he sat in the belfry upon the belfry man, who was lying flat upon his back. In his teeth, the villain held the bell rope, which he kept jerking about with his head, raising such a clatter that my ears ring again even to think of it. On his lap lay the big fiddle, at which he was scraping out of all time and tune with both hands, making a great show, the nincompoop. 
of playing J Judy of Flanagan and Patty of Rafferty. Affairs being thus miserably situated, I left the place in disgust, and now appeal for aid to all lovers of correct time and fine kraut. Let us proceed in a body to the borough and restore the ancient order of things in Vundervatimatis by ejecting that little fellow from the steeple. Wow. <laughs> Uh, yes, that was fantastic. Again, I say that all the time because I'm never disappointed with Pope. Um, so in my own mind, I imagined him like looking at a clock, like a cuckoo clock or something that was carved with all this stuff and making a story out of it. That's where my mind went. But also... I don't I I did. I love the the name where that came from. I don't I don't I don't know if they're supposed to be um perhaps maybe a what's the um uh a saying against people who have to be just sort of on time or maybe he's somebody who likes to be on time and considers people who are not on time as like the devil as they usually or used to say but it did it seemed like it was supposed to be just a funny potentially satirical sort of a story especially with again the name that that just tickled the the <laughs> i'm a lady that tickled me greatly um so yes uh i'm thinking that there are also perhaps things that i don't understand um, country specific that would be also interesting to to look into um, yes but other than that that was the devil in the belfry the story of the borough of Vandervatimata is which again wonderful beautiful anyway lionizing oh Oh no! Mm, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to do this one. Oh, it looks very short. Okay, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm probably going to have to finish with this one, and then I will have to be done. So we're going to start immediately. This is lionizing. And let's see. Give a lot of public attention and approval to someone. Treat as a celebrity. Interesting. Okay. Lionizing. Blank. All people went upon their ten toes in wild wonderment. Bishop Hall's... Sir Carey's? I don't know. I am, that is to say I was, a great man. But I am neither the author of Junius nor the man in the mask. For my name, I believe, is Robert Jones, and I was born somewhere in the city of Thumbfudge. The first action of my life was the taking hold of my nose with both hands. My mother saw this and called me a genius. My father wept for joy and presented me with a treatise on nosology. This I mastered before I was breached. I now began to feel my way in the science, and soon came to understand that, provided a man had a nose sufficiently conspicuous, he might, by merely following it, arrive at a lion's ship. But my attention was not confined to theories alone. Every morning I gave my proboscis a couple of pulls and swallowed a half dozen of drams. When I came of age, my father asked me one day if I would step with him into his study. My son, said he, when we were seated, what is the chief end of your existence? My father, I answered, it is the study of nosology. And what, Robert, he inquired, is nosology? Sir, I said, it is the science of noses. And can you tell me, he demanded, what is the meaning of a nose? A nose, my father, I replied, greatly softened, has been variously defined by about a thousand different authors. Here I pulled out my watch. It is now noon or thereabouts. We shall have time enough to get through with them all before midnight. To commence, then, the nose, according to Bartholo Bartholinus, is that protuberance, that bump, that excrescence, that— Will do, Robert, interrupted the good old gentleman. I am thunderstruck at the extent of your information. I am positively upon my soul. Here he closed his eyes and placed his hand upon his heart. Come here. 
Here he took me by the arm. Your education may now be considered as finished. It is high time you should scuffle for yourself, and you cannot do a better thing than merely follow your nose. So, so, so. Here he kicked me downstairs and out of the door. So get out of my house, and God bless you. As I felt within me the divine afflatus, afflatus, a divine creative impulse or inspiration, afflatus, afflatus, as I felt within me the, defi the divine afflatus, I considered this accident rather fortunate than otherwise. I resolved to be guided by the paternal advice. I determined to follow my nose. I gave it a pull or two upon the spot and wrote a pamphlet on nosology forthwith. All fum fudge was in an uproar. Wonderful genius, said the quarterly. Superb physiologist, said the Westminster. Clever fellow, said the foreign. Fine writer, said the Edinburgh. Profound thinker, said the Dublin. Great man, said Bentley. Divine soul, said Fraser. Fraser, Fraser. One of us, said Blackwood. Who can he be, said Mrs. Bablu. What can he be, said Big Miss Bablu. Where can he be, said Little Miss Bablu. But I paid these people no attention whatever. I just stepped into the shop of an artist. The Duchess of Bless My Soul was sitting for her portrait. The Marquis of So-and-So was holding the Duchess's poodle. The Earl of This and That was flirting with her salts. And His Royal Highness of Touch Me Not was leaning upon the back of her chair. I approached the artist and turned up my nose. Oh, beautiful, sighed her grace. Oh, my, lisped the Marquis. Oh, shocking, groaned the Earl. Oh, abominable, growled his royal highness. What will you take for it, asked the artist. For his nose, shouted her grace. A thousand pounds, said I, sitting down. Sorry, oh gosh. A thousand pounds, said I, sitting down. A thousand pounds, inquired the artist musingly. A thousand pounds, said I. Beautiful, said he, entranced. A thousand pounds, said I. Do you warrant it, he asked, turning the nose to the light. I do, said I, blowing it well. Is it quite original, he inquired, touching it with reverence. Humph, said I, twisting it to one side. Has no copy been taken, he demanded, surveying it through a microscope. None, said I, turning it up. Admirable, he ejaculated, thrown quite off his guard by the beauty of the maneuver. A thousand pounds, said I. A thousand pounds, said he. Precisely, said I. A thousand pounds, said he. Just so, said I. You shall have them, said he. What a prince of vertu. Vertu? Vertu? So he drew me a check upon the spot and took a sketch of my nose. I engaged rooms in German Street and sent Her Majesty the 99th edition of the Nosology with a portrait of the proboscis. That sad little rake, the Prince of Wales, invited me to dinner. We were all lions and recherche. And researchers? Recherche? There was a modern pla platonist. He quoted Porphyry, Iamblichus, Plotinus, Proclus, Hier Hier Hierocles, Hierocles, Maximus Tyrius, and Syrianus. There was a human perfectibility man. He quoted Turgo, Price Priestley, Condorcet de, de Stael, and the ambitious student in ill health. There was a surpositive paradox. He observed that all fools were philosophers and that all philosophers were fools. There was aestheticus ethics. Ah. There was aestheticus ethics. He spoke of fire, unity, and atoms, bipart and pre-existent soul, affinity and discord, primitive intelligence, and homomeria. There was theologos, theology. He talked of Eusebius and Arianus, heresy and the Council of Nice, nice, Puseism and consubstantialism, homus, homusius and homu, homuioisius. I don't think that's real. There was fricassee from the Rocher de Concale. He mentioned miraton, miraton of red tongue, cauliflowers with velote sauce, veal a la Saint Menehault, marinade a la Saint Florentine, and orange jellies in mosaics. There was Bibulus o Bumper. He touched upon Latour and Mark Brunin, upon Musex and Chamberton, Chamberton upon Rich, Richburg and St. George, upon Habrion, Leonville, and Medoc, 
upon Barak and Pragnak, upon Gra Grav, upon Saturn, upon Lafitte, and upon Saint Pere. He shook his head at Claude de Vujiot, Vujiot, and told, with his eyes shut, the difference between Sherry and Amontillado. There was Signor Tinton Tintino from Florence. He discoursed of Sim Simabue, Arpino, Carpaccio, and Argostino, of the gloom of Caravaggio, of the amenity of Albano, of the colors of Titian, of the frows of Rubens, and of the waggeries of Jan Steen. There was the president of the Fumfudge University. He was of opinion that the moon was called Bendis in Thrace, Bubastis in Egypt, Diane in Rome, and Artemis in Greece. There was a Grand Turk from Stamboul. He could not help thinking that the angels were horses, cocks, and bulls, that somebody in the sixth heaven had 70,000 heads, and that the earth was supported by a sky-blue cow with an incalculable number of green horns. There was Delphinus Polyglot. He told us that ha what had become of the 83 lost tragedies of Aeschylus, of the 54 orations of Isaeus, of the 391 speeches of Lysias, of the 180 treatise treatises of Theophrastus, of the eighth book of the conic sections of Apol Apollon Ap Apollonius, of Pindar's hymns and dithyrambics, and of the five and forty tragedies of Homer Jr. There were Fer there was Ferdinand Fitzfossilus Feldspar. He he's going to be about uh, yeah minerals and. He informed us all about internal fires and tertiary formations, about iriforms, fluidiforms, and solidiforms, about quartz and marl, about schist and shoral, about gypsum and trap, about talc and calc, about blend and hornblende, about mica slate and pudding stone, about cyanite and lepidolite, about hematite and tremolite, about anemone and chalcedony, about manganese and whatever you please. There was myself. I spoke of myself. Of myself, of myself, of myself, of nosology, of my pamphlet, and of myself. I turned up my nose, and I spoke of myself. Marvelous, clever man, said the prince. Superb, said his guests, and next morning her grace, bless my soul, paid me a visit. Will you go to Almax, pretty creature, she said, tapping me under the chin. Upon honor, said I. Nose and all, she asked. As I live, I replied. Here then is a card, my life. Shall I say you will be there? Dear Duchess, with all my heart, pshaw, no, but with all your nose, every bit of it, my love, said I. So I gave it a twist or two, and found myself at Almax. The rooms were crowded to suffocation. He is coming, said somebody on the staircase. He is coming, said somebody farther up. He is coming, said somebody farther still. He has come, exclaimed the Duchess. He has come, the little love, and seizing me firmly by both hands, she kissed me thrice upon the nose. A marked sensation immediately ensued. Uh, devil? Uh, God, God save us? Ah. God save him? Oh, gosh darn it! Come here, come here. We were going so well, kind of. Yeah, God, God keep us. And a thousand, thousand tons? Uh, thunders. A thousand thunders. Uh, devil, cried Count Capricorn, Capricornity. Uh, God keep us, muttered Don Stiletto, and a thousand thunders ejaculated the Prince of Gren... Gren... Grenouille? Grenouille. A uh, thousand twofold. A thousand devils. Ha, we just learned that one. Growled the Elector of Bludna. Or at least I learned it. Um, blu... Blu... Bludna? Bludna. Bludna? It was not to be born. I grew angry. I turned short up upon Bludna. Sir, said I to him, you are a baboon. Sir, he replied after a pause, Donner und Blitzen. This was all that could be desired. We exchanged cards. At Chalk Farm the next morning, I shot off his nose, and then called upon my friends. A uh, bit, said the first. Fool, said the second. Dolt. Bite, said the first. Fool, said the second. Dolt, said the third. Ass, said the fourth. Ninny, said the fifth. Noodle, said the sixth. Beoth, said the seventh. At all this, I felt mortified, and so called upon my father. Father, I asked, what is the chief end of my existence? My son, he replied, it is still the study of nosology, but in hitting the elector upon the nose you have overshot your mark. You have a fine nose, it is true, but then Bludnuff has none. You are damned, and he has become the hero of the day. I grant you that in Fumfudge the greatness of a lion is in proportion to the size of his proboscis. 
But, good heavens, there is no competing with a lion who has no proboscis at all. What? Ah, <laughs> uh, I mean... See, there is. There are two possibilities here. That there is some story in here, which I'm, I may analyze a little bit. Um, or there's absolutely none, and it is all just gibberish and just fun, because I, I, I'm trying to think of any of the other stories where that might have been the case. I'm sure, okay, so, the, the greatness of a lion is in proportion to the size of his proboscis, but good heavens, there is no competing with a lion who has no proboscis at all. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is it? Oh, ooh. Okay, hang on. All people went on their ten toes in wild wonderment. So is it something where... <sighs> okay, I'll see if I can try and... figure out how to describe what I'm trying to... Th what I'm thinking. So, it's one thing to have something... <laughs> that I don't know so okay just gonna go for it some it's something to have something of note very obvious very um like it's noticeable and then there's another to have like nothing at all like like okay so there's like the middle normal right or common and then there's something of note or there's a notable absence I'm not sure where that's going but I think it's going somewhere <laughs> I'm not sure I do I I think it might go somewhere or it might just be it, it might just be a sort of satire, or I'm not sure what um, specifically it would be called, where it's just a, um, it's just some, it's fun, it's trollish, it's satirical, it's, it's funny. So I don't, I think. So yes. I don't know. There, I do. I think that that's something where it's the, the nature of a thing versus the absence of the thing. Because, ooh, okay, hang on. Because, hi, there is, oh, and I'm going to have to go. Oh, no. Because it did. It, it had all of these philosophy um, from various places, including science and mathematics. Um... So it might, it might be something where it, it, it's slightly satirical of philosophy itself. Well, yeah, oh, yes. And general study, like, oh, ooh, 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 ooh. So he's, so he's studying nosology, right? Which is weird thing to study. And X expert in become an expert in oh my gosh um so it's one thing if you know a lot in a subject and it's another to not know anything at all or at least to have so i don't i don't want to say that this is actually what it is but it could be um like contrasting having extensive knowledge in a certain subject versus having n oh so like again like a jack of all trades um a jack of all trades beats a master of none is what i think is that i think how that goes uh so hang on no a jack of all trades beats a master of none i'm not sure but so i think so I think kind of potential, potential contrast between 
um, studying something so minutely in such studying something so minutely as to become an expert in it of something so superfluous or unnecessary versus not doing that and or having various knowledge of different things or knowledge of various things without ever delving deeper deep enough in anything that's unnecessary if that makes sense I don't know <laughs> I started out thinking that it didn't that it was just kind of a a funny sort of thing but I do I I, I think Poe always has some sort of even without meaning not without meaning to but it's Again, again, I don't... The story needs to come before the moral or the message. In, in literature, in cinema, all of that. That's, that's just the nature of entertainment. Is that it needs to have the sugar coating over the pill, right? And nowadays... <laughs> I talk about this a lot, but it is. It's because I have, I had and still have such a love for literature, stories, movies, TV, all of that. I, theater, all of that. I love it very much. Not a lot of the modern stuff because it has lost a lot of the art of it, has gone into the trying to be sending a message versus telling a story. So what he does is his moral, his message is so well woven into the story that you think that there isn't one, but then once you actually look deeper, you find it. And that's my thoughts on that. <laughs> so that was lionizing. And I apologize. Yeah, if... I, I could. I could be absolutely wrong. But that's the thing, too. If it makes... If it brings that idea in, is it wrong? <laughs> to some degree, yes. It, like, uh Anyway, I could, I could go on and on about this. I love it so much. That was Lion Isaac. Uh, this has been... Edgar Allan Poe, short stories. The grotesque, the romantic and the humorous, and the philosophical, apparently. So Thursday will be more watching, probably mu Muster, Muster Keaton, Buster Keaton, more of that, which is, I am, I'm, I'm falling in love with Buster Keaton, too. Um, and then I'm going to potentially try something different on Sunday, game-wise. I might be trying some flight simulator. Ah! And that will be interesting. Um... Because I'm probably going, I, I should set up a swear drive for that because I think I'll have a harder time not swearing with that than I do with spooky games, which is interesting. Uh, but yes, I do. I think that's, I think that's what I'm going to do. So yes, so Thursday, Thursday, uh, aroundish the same time and this was fun. This was very fun. I enjoyed the stories. I hope you did too. To whoever got lost and found their way here or found their way back, thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you again soon. Have a good whatever it's going to be for you. And thanks again and bye. <laughs>